Good morning, everyone. It's it's unusual to get a little bit of silence uh, before a grand rounds, and that is that is definitely our cue uh, to start off. So this is uh, this is our semi-annual ethics conference. This is taking just a little bit uh, different shape. Uh, th this is a, a topic obviously near and dear to many of our hearts uh, in this building. Uh, and yet was not a topic that was suggested by anyone in this building. It was actually uh, something that's been uh, the front of the mind of uh, our, our moderator uh, and, and talented guest, uh, Jay Jacobson. Uh, Jay Jacobson, uh, emeritus uh, professor of internal medicine, uh, practice infectious disease, uh, and is, and I forget the exact title, forgive me, uh, of your role in, in medical ethics. Uh, I just consider him to be the medical ethics guru uh, for, for the health sciences. Uh, he'll be joined today by Dr. Avni Shah. Uh, most of you should know Dr. Avni Shah. She's been here a year, although been here is um, maybe not the accurate uh, term. Uh, she, she has uh, been a fellow for the past year, but she's been traveling uh, all over the world representing uh, Moran and building collaborations as our uh, global fellow. So with that, i uh, turn it over to Jay Jacobson for Ethics, Epidemiology, and Health Policy, What's the Macula? And thank you for coming, Paul Bernstein, just so that we can answer this question. Thanks, Joe. Well, I'm very flattered. I haven't been called a guru before, but I'm guessing maybe that's an age uh, criteria. <laughs> But um, my connection with ethics was we established the Division of Medical Ethics. Actually, very exciting because uh, not every medical school had one in 1988, and many of them were not led by physicians. Um, often there were people with a background in theology or philosophy. So it's really, really exciting. But backgrounds are important, and my background is uh, infectious disease, which also does epidemiology and public health. So I think I've always had a focus on the larger community and how to keep that community healthy and prevent illness. And that's actually not an unusual transition, I think, to things like ethics and particularly policy. So that's a good way. And again, I, whenever I speak with your group, I think in terms of ophthalmology voc vocabulary. So think of my lens as the lens that includes public health. So when I see individual cases, I can't help but see all the cases that are around them, right? The ones that transmitted to them and the potential for them to transmit to others. So it's a, it's a rather large view. Um, I mentioned that I always think about your vocabulary when we talk, and I think the background for this is pretty straightforward. The progress in medicine over the last, let's say, 70 years has been extraordinary. And I think that a lot of that is about technology and clinical skill. And the direction of that is incredibly positive. Always more, always better. I think on the other hand, from that public health view, we've actually also made some progress. In the US, it's kind of almost stumbling or iterative. It's a little bit of progress, sometimes some steps back, and then some more progress. But we're at a very unusual point right now. We seem to have stalled. And I think that um, many people are concerned about the next step in terms of healthcare in the United States. And I think many people are troubled by it. And I think the thing that I hear about government and policy is the phrase, what's the matter? So as I was just saying to one of you, you could think of this as a typo. The real question, of course, is what's the matter? But in terms of your vocabulary, I really thought a lot about that. I think that you could describe some of our policy as, say, um, nearsighted or myopic. You might want to call it farsighted, or maybe that's desirable. But I have to say, when I'm thinking about 2020, when this whole country is likely to be talking about um, policy and law and change, I'm actually now a little worried as I think of Donald Trump and the leading Democratic contenders, uh, Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden, that maybe the problem will be presbyopia. <laughs> so anyway, what, what to say? Um, the reason that I picked the macula is I think um, the macula is, is not just a metaphor, it's real about keen, clear, straight ahead vision. And that's exactly what we're going to need to do better in terms of health policy and health outcomes. And so we'll talk about several things today. I'm gonna to bracket that and talk a little bit about ethics and health policy. 
And Avni is going to talk about something that's even more real. She's going to talk about this health issue, but from the standpoint of ophthalmology, literally about eye health, where you are, <laughs> how we compare to others, and maybe what the direction is of the state of vision health in the United States. And so that's kind of something that will ground you, but I hope that you will leave thinking about what would be the policy at the national level, state level, and maybe the Moran level that you would like to see going forward so we continue to make progress. So ethics, usually about what you should do. It's about the right action. Um, epidemiology is about what's out there and what makes it the way it is. So we look at not only incidence and prevalence, but we look at association as kind of a hint at cause. And that's also, if we understand causes, we may understand, if we understand causes <coughs> of problems, we may understand solutions. And then finally, health policy, unlike ethics, is not always about what you should do. It's often about what you must do or what you must not do and it often guides how you manage to do that. So for example, in terms of insurance and funding, policy is kind of both an enabler, but it can be a crippler. So all three of these are really, really important. Let's see. Um, so you know what the macula is, and this image is our U.S. Capitol. That's actually a statue of George Washington, and he's standing in the rotunda looking up at the dome of the Capitol. And I was actually struck by how analogous that image was to what you all see when you look into the eye. Um, George Washington actually spoke in some very relevant metaphors. Uh, this is what he had to say. No morn ever dawned more favorable than ours did, and no day was ever more clouded than the present. Wisdom and good examples are necessary at this time to rescue the political machine from the impending storm. Leadership is not only having a vision, but also having the courage, the discipline, and the resources to let you get there. When there is no vision, there is no hope. So I think that's a really nice foundation for kind of starting off, and I, I think this picture of the Capitol, where we all would like clarity and clear vision and kind of getting through the clouds to where we want to be. So these two images actually pretty well depict the steps that we've taken uh, in healthcare in the United States. Um, on the left is President Johnson turning over his presidency which established two terribly important programs in American healthcare, Medicare and Medicaid, and also one that I think we often forget about, which was a children's health initiative. Interestingly enough, that was a Democratic president turning the reins over to a Republican one, but those programs have actually endured. So since 1968, we have had Medicare and Medicaid. So what Johnson said was, no longer will older Americans be denied the healing miracle of modern medicine. No longer will illness crush and destroy the savings that they have so carefully put away over a lifetime so that they might enjoy dignity in their later years. No longer will young families see their own incomes and their own hopes eaten away simply because they are carrying out their deep moral obligations to their parents. Better health for our children, all of our children, is essential if we have, are to have a better America. So he said, I propose a child health program, that's in addition to Medicare and Medicaid, to provide over the next five years for families unable to afford it access to health services from prenatal care of the mother through the child's first year. When we do that, you will find it is the best investment we ever made because we will get these diseases in their infancy. We will find a cure in a great many instances that we can never find by overcrowding our hospitals when they are grown. So you have that transition and that pro those programs, all of them have endured. 
Um, and in fact, there's a question, right, about expanding Medicaid in our present era to include more people. So those programs have remained viable. The picture on the right, of course, is Barack Obama. And Barack Obama, both famous and notorious in our country for moving the agenda toward what was formerly called the Affordable Care Act, but because of his link to it, often referred to as Obamacare. Let me tell you what he had to say. He said, I'm here for my mother and all the Americans who are forced to spend time arguing with health insurance companies instead of focusing on getting well. I'm here for the millions of lives that will be touched and in some cases saved by health insurance reform. I'm here for the small businesses who are forced to choose between health care and hiring. I'm here for the seniors who are unable to afford the prescriptions they need. He went on to say, we're unique among advanced countries that we don't have universal health care. My hope, Obama speaking, was that I was able to get 100% of people health care while I was president. We didn't quite achieve that, but we were able to get 20 million people health care who didn't have it before. And obviously, some of the progress we made is now imperiled because there's still a significant debate taking place in the United States. And I think you know, really in the presence and shortly uh, toward the end of this year and in 2020, health care and health care reform will in fact be the largest focus of the debate for the presidency. Um, in the middle of that period, a Republican president actually initiated a health reform policy for the country. And this is now a very unusual picture. There are eight people standing behind President Reagan. Four of them are Democrats. They're in the center. And four of them are Republicans. So a very fair question is, what is there about health policy that may also be political? And so the background for Medicare Obviously, technology was advancing. There were more drugs, more treatments, more expensive. Older people were not working. They didn't have work-related insurance, and they were sicker. So they had greater need for more expensive care, and they couldn't meet it. So in response to that, you get Medicare. On the other end, you have, again, people who are not working for any reason or who are working at low-paying, non-union jobs don't have insurance in the country, and that policy was designed to address it. So what about this policy? So MTALA, you know about that, Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, signed by a Republican president. The background would be dumping. So as medical care became more expensive and people without insurance were showing up in emergency rooms, hospitals were transferring them to other hospitals, often with fewer skills, right, so-called public hospitals. And as a result, their treatment was delayed. Some got no treatment at all. Some obviously died. And the treatment that some got was inferior to what they would have gotten in a hospital with full resources if they had committed to it. So call that a crisis that kind of grew out of both progress in medicine and the cost. Well, how did this bill work and get bipartisan support? Well, for the people that were being dumped, this bill made it illegal to do that. It said that the hospital in which they appear must take care of them. So that's why the Democrats are in the picture. They would be advocating, as they have for a long time, for very broad-based health care. Why are the Republicans there? This was not a federally funded program. So while the hospitals were obligated to provide the treatment, the government had no obligation to pay the support. So this was, in a sense, a program that took the financial responsibility off the government's shoulders and put it out actually on the medical community, particularly on hospitals and potentially on insurers. Because as you can see, those hospitals that were moving away expensive care by dumping patients were now obliged to provide it. And somehow they needed to pay for it. And the only solution available was to transfer the cost to other patients who could and would pay. So patients with means or patients <coughs> with uh, ins insurance. So I think you can see the bullet points there. And I think a good thing to remember is that while I've said it shifted the cost to the institution, it also shifts the cost to the individual. So an individual who's not insured but is treated is in fact billed 
usually for the treatment provided. Some of that treatment can be incredibly expensive, and as you well know, trying to pay for medical care or being obliged to pay is one of the largest causes of bankruptcy in our country. So interesting to take a look at this policy, which met some needs, but also had some significant consequences. So this is a way of looking historically at what I said was kind of the stumbling progress that we've made. So we've talked a little bit about Lyndon Johnson and Medicare and Medicaid. What you want to appreciate is before that bill, one in four Americans had no insurance. So the uninsured rate was about 25%. And with that particular set of programs, Medicare, Medicaid, Children's Health, you can see that it fell to about 12 or 13. And it continued to fall as that program was implemented and sort of steadied out somewhere around 14 to 15 percent. And then you can take a look at the right. President Obama came into office first in 28, and by 2012 had succeeded almost entirely with one party to pass the Affordable Care Act, right? And that didn't really go into full effect until about 2014. But you can see the incremental fall again down to about 8%. That's the 20 million people that President <coughs> Obama talked about. A really good thing to recall is who those people were. So you know they weren't the elderly because there were no changes for people over 65. In some states, they weren't the very poor because some states chose to leave Medicaid exactly the way it was. What had changed were middle-aged and younger people who did not have insurance. That actually is going to turn out to be really important for you because that's the period of time other than early childhood where you're going to recognize the beginning of many important eye diseases at a point where they're treatable and or preventable. So that's the group that really constitutes the 20 million. So that's the story just through about 2015. If you look at this a little more closely, just more recent periods from 2008, which is Obama coming in, and then you can see the, the improvement in the percent uninsured right after 2014, what you must also appreciate is that things are going back the other way. So the proportion of our country uninsured, even toward the end of the Obama administration, was creeping up and now it's almost back to where we started, about 14%, and you know what's happened, right? So you have a Congress that hasn't offered a new proposal, but has been eviscerating the very heart of this particular program, which was the mandate. That's actually what made insurers willing to do this. That is, they were covering people who before could not be covered, people with pre-existing conditions, they wanted to collect more premiums from people who didn't need care. Think of that young, healthier population without insurance. And the government stood behind them. Again, this is very different than the Reagan program. Instead of you can't pay that premium, we'll pay it. So we're heading back that way. And I think that's the direction we're likely to be in unless something changes. So for today, what I'm hoping to do are the first three of these quickly, and they will be quick. It's asking the question, what do our professional organizations require of us, but particularly with reference to what do they require of us in terms of caring for people who might otherwise be unable to afford care? So that's, that's the key question. What do we expect of ourselves? You're going to answer that. I will ask you about that in sort of a gated way and with some scenarios, and then we can proceed to what Avni will do is talk about, well, wow, once you've decided what your targets are and what your goals are, she's going to show you, in a way, what those targets look like. Um, obviously, um, she also will give you an idea, and I'll just say right now, how federal health policy has shaped access to eye care is exactly the way it shaped access to any other care. So for emergencies, something like Mtala has actually made more eye care available to more people in excellent institutions where they go for help after an injury, for example. It doesn't address the payment for that treatment. But in terms of getting an emergency treated, no question, better off. Um, also, just insurance for non-acute 
reasons to visit the hospital. Insurance is often what provides access for people. If they're contemplating even a routine care visit, which from their standpoint seems expensive, a huge difference is made by whether that will be paid for completely or not. Even something as simple as glasses, whether they're paid for or not, makes a very big difference to many people. Uh, who's vision at risk? Uh, Avni will talk about that and why. Uh, what are we doing to meet our goals? And what changes in policy would optimize eye care? I think my goal for you is that after today, hearing what I have to say, and particularly what Avni has, that as you hear people roll out some of these rather arcane, really broad policy proposals, you will look at them with macular vision. You will look to see whether a universal health plan even covers vision insurance. Just so you know, not everyone does. Canada has a system that we point to as a model system, but it doesn't provide coverage for routine eye care. So you want to look for that and then be looking at the kinds of programs that will actually serve the communities that Avni tells you need your help. So this is kind of the standard conjunction of overlapping circles, ethics that I explained to you, policy, and law, right? So should, must, and how to do it. It's really more complicated than that, and I think that top circle is the one where you can contribute tremendously. Most of the people who have been offering healthcare proposals do not have an ophthalmologist at their side. Trust me, many of them don't even have practicing clinicians at their side. So people who have experience in how medicine works, literally where the rubber meets the road, have to be a part of this debate. And so you could at least be discerning voters, but even better would be for you to share your advice as a group as people who advocate for good vision in America, you could be informing these policies as they develop. So we have never talked about this kind of ethics at this meeting. Much of American medical ethics is grounded around something called de deontology, rules of behavior. You will see that in codes of ethics. You will hear it in the way hospitals talk about how physicians should behave. It's very, very rule-based. Um, some ethics is consequential. We always ask the question of what's the greater good? As we look at any problem, we ask, you know, if I do it this way, will it be better for more people than if I do it the other way? Those are two very different ways of approaching ethics. Here's a third. This is called virtue-based, that what physicians or other people in responsible positions do is actually a moral imperative that comes from what it is they're doing, or even where they're situated. Let's make it really easy. Imagine a guy at the beach. Someone is hundreds of yards off from shore, the wind has picked up, and they're obviously flailing and drowning. A very skilled swimmer, very motivated, rather heroic, might strike out and attempt to save them. Let me add, untrained. However, a lifeguard, sitting in a chair, spending most of his time just protecting his skin with sunblock, sees that and has an obligation. That's a duty of station. And you would immediately judge that lifeguard, good, bad, appropriate, inappropriate, responsible, irresponsible, by what the lifeguard did in that situation. That's their job. So one of the questions to think about is what are the duties and obligations that go with being a physician? And that's something that we're going to think about for the next remaining time. Um, you know some special ones. You know that the duty of station for a priest in Catholicism is to listen to everyone who wishes to confess, to keep that information confidential, and to grant absolution. I mean, that goes with the territory. If a priest declined to do that, in many ways they wouldn't fully be a priest. They wouldn't be a virtuous priest by this definition. We never really have had much of a discussion in America about what are the constitutive duties that go with being a physician. So uh, that pretty much summarizes what we've had to say. And I think what I'm going to share now is 
what our organizations have had to say about our duties. And remember what I said, they're usually phrased in terms of rules, and they take a lot of account of things like law and policy. So the first one, I, I'm only gonna show you a few. The first of these is that it's actually your job to respect the law, but also your responsibility to seek some changes in the law which might be contrary to the best interests of a patient. So obviously in that one rule, you have two things going on. You have kind of an allegiance or an obligation to patients, but similarly an obligation to the law. So there's a problem for you. If you're living in a situation where the law is not what's best for the patient, what in fact should you be doing? You must follow the law, that's the first part, but how does that feel if you're following a law which you believe is not best for the patients you serve? The next one is, that in providing care, and notice this one, except in emergencies, I need to let you know that was written after the EMTALA Act was in place. So even though it doesn't specify a law here, law is looming very large in the background. Except in emergencies, be free to choose whom to serve. So that's actually also a really fascinating and very American kind of codification of the idea of independence, liberty, and autonomy. But it's fair to ask whether that comports with the obligation of a physician. You go very early, way back, third century BC to Hippocrates, you really don't have that idea of being free to choose. The idea there was if they were sick and they came to you or even you went to them, the obligation was to treat. So it was a very large obligation, but in a very different world with very little to offer and very little that was so expensive. So I think worth remembering that one. Uh, the next one is a physician should recognize the responsibility to do things that lead to the improvement of the community and the betterment of public health. So it's a little soft in the sense you should recognize the responsibility. They stayed away from words like you should or even you must, but I think that's an important thing to think about that our larger umbrella organization thinks that we should be at least looking, I'll use a visual, looking at what's going on that might improve the community. And then finally, and this is the most recent addition, a physician shall support access to medical care for all people. So again, that's actually a response to things that were happening in the country. The Medicare Medicaid bill, the EMTALA bill, and it preceded the Affordable Care Act. But try to think carefully now, as you know about policy, that access was supported by the EMTALA Act. More people literally could get in and stay in emergency rooms and hospitals than before the Act, but it didn't handle how that would be paid. So as you think about access, you now have to think about it in a complex way. It not only means ability to get through the door, but it has to have a strategy for how that is supported. Your own academy, <clears throat> it's, in its kind of preface to the code of ethics, says that an issue of ethics, I presume they mean a problem or a dilemma, in ophthalmology is resolved by the determination that the best interests of patients are served. So there's a theme. Through medical ethics historically and in very recent times, it's very <coughs> clear that we give at least verbal attention to the best interests of patients. What's not as clear as how you wrestle with the best interests of patients and your own best interests or the institution's best interests or maybe even the best interests of the country. If you think about it, fixing everything might take more than what we have. Might be best, but if you can't do it all, there are some people that won't be fixed. So best interest is pretty complicated. It's the best interest of whom, when, and how. Um, what it does say more specifically is that your services, and please notice there is nothing here about an obligation to treat people who cannot pay, but it says the services must be given with compassion, respect for dignity, honesty, and integrity, and the closest it comes to talking about what you charge or what you receive is that fees must not exploit patients or others. And then it, like the American Medical Association says, there's also a community responsibility to improve the health and well-being of the patient, and it adds in a cost-effective way. 
which I think is fine, and I think you should be thinking about that when you think about policy. Thinking about policy from just our perspective, making people healthy, ignores the fact, for example, could we do it the same, at the same quality but for less money? Or if we do this, what is it that we're giving up? That's actually what your congressmen have to face and what any president will have to face. So as you're thinking about policy, you want to be thinking about arguments that you would make that would make preventing visual impairment, improving it, treating it, et cetera. Why is that important? And why might that be more important than some of the other things that will be competing for public support? <clears throat> in, in this uh, special issue of seminars and ophthalmology, I think I saw the farthest reach for ophthalmology. That is, I, most of the things I read, obviously I don't read what you do, but reviews are about the progress that's made in a new drug or a technical treatment or a diagnosis. This is a focus on who has the eye disease and what should be done. So you can see what I highlighted. Eliminating, first of all, that's a really strong word. In my field, that's, we use that word because we've eliminated smallpox, we've almost eliminated polio, and I'm talking now in a frame that you understand, I'm talking about around the world. This is for our country that we're talking about today, or for your state, or for your community, but eliminating is a very strong word, right? And for an individual practitioner, that's a huge responsibility. So if you wanna think about eliminating, you obviously have to think about how do we do this? I mean, I can't do this alone, so what do I engage? Eliminating racial, sex, and gender, and regional variations in health, disease, and outcomes is a stated goal of the Institute of Medicine, the National Institutes of Health, and at least during the Obama administration, the US government. And that could come back again. It could be a goal to eliminate a certain disease. We had that goal with measles. And I just share with you, from my field, it's the same problem I'm talking to you about. We made a lot of progress, and we're slipping back. But policy and law will help us to get back to where we were. So uh, there's this new initiative called IRIS, right? Intelligent Research and Sight. The field of ophthalmology, this obviously your field, and I was excited to see that, is in a position to take a more quantitative look at disparities in outcomes. And we've talked before about AI and big data. That will also help you, if you choose to, to take a patient-centered, by that I mean designing your treatments that acknowledge why people are not coming to you um, or what beliefs they have that are impeding their seeking of care or maybe following good regimens so that you could take a patient-centered approach uh, to patient perceptions of unmet access and disparities. So here's the questions that can kind of frame um, what Avni is going to say. Um, I'm going to ask you actually to maybe raise your hands, and then I might ask some of you to give a reason. So here are three choices, three things that I'll ask you to raise your hands about. A is to prevent preventable visual impairment in some people. The key word here, some. And if we have a minute, we'll ask, well, who are the people you're going to prevent it in, and how will you do that? B is the same thing, prevent that kind of preventable impairment, but in most people. And the third one is in all. And so let's go back to that ambitious goal, right, which is kind of complete, right? Do you want to be complete? So thinking about yourselves, and if you wish, thinking about your larger community of ophthalmologists. So for the academics, you can be thinking about the private practice community. Private practitioners can think about that. If you wish, you can think about the public health that's available in our state. So that's the frame. How many of you believe that the duty, we're back to duties of station, that it is your duty to prevent visual impairment in some people? Okay, you want to keep that in mind, and you want to keep in mind what you are doing, right? And Avni is going to tell you that. That is, do the data show that you prevent it in some, most, or all, but you're telling me you don't think your duty is to prevent it in some. Let's try the next one. Is it your duty to prevent the preventable in most people? This is very striking, and Avni and I didn't know. But do I have someone that would take that position? Well, I, sure. I have two. So let me start with Jeff and then go behind you. 
Well, I think Dr. Bernstein. Most, I mean, we're, we're trying to do, but you can't do everything. That's, I think, so that's why I'm kind of not going for C. So first of all, very logical answer and very defensible, and it's just true that you can't do everything. I just tell you, I accept that. Now keep thinking about the lifeguard. So what's the lifeguard's duty? And let's all acknowledge that he can't do the impossible, right? This is pretty clear. On a day when seven people are drowning, each of them 100 yards from the other, right? There's almost no way, one li there's, I'm sure there's no way, that one lifeguard could save all seven. Was it his duty? Yes, actually it was, but we understand why he failed in that duty. So that's a pretty straightforward one, and it, does, it helps you really get into that. You know what the duty is now, but you know that having a duty doesn't make you able to do it all the time. So if there was one person drowning and he didn't go, we're pretty clear, right? The reason we're upset is that it was his duty and he could have done it. So let me, I, that's really helpful, Paul. Jeff. I think in a way, depending on the scale you're looking at, they are all true, right? If you're looking at an individual physician level, what you can do in some, and, and, and so on and so forth, depending on how far you expand that. So I think it really depends on what the question is, duties of all collective ophthalmologists in our state versus in our practice, in our community, or in your one-person practice. So again, I th were you able to hear Jeff's point? Uh, his point is that they're all true at the level of performability. That is, it just begins with the truth that Paul pointed out. No one doc can do it all. But then it's a question for you about this idea of duties of station. For example, there could be more than one lifeguard on the beach. If there were two, they would be able to do more, and they would be the two people with that responsibility. So one of the questions for you to think about is, is this, in fact, inherent in being an ophthalmologist? If you're at Moran and you have a large faculty all around you with different skills, obviously you do as much as you can, but you probably feel good, if you're looking at these, that your colleagues are amplifying that. So together you're doing more. I'm kind of inviting you, I think, to think that way, to, to really take that on, that it's a large community of ophthalmologists and actually growing. Right? It's actually one of the fields that's very attractive to young physicians. So a growing field, and so think about it in terms of just duty, right? And the duties could be fine. That is for a plumber, for example. I don't think any plumber feels that it's plumber's job to fix the pipes in everybody's home. I don't think we think about that. I think we think of that as a trade or a craft, and we think he should do a good job for the people that pay him to do it. So we don't condemn the universe of plumbers for coming up short. But I think we haven't thought that way about ophthalmologists. OK, I'm up to three. How many of you think that it's the duty, that's the word we're using, of ophthalmologists to prevent preventable impairment in all people? I have a lot of abstainers. If you abstained, just either raise your hand on this one if you agree, and then I'll ask you about the other. So here's what I saw. I didn't see hands before. I saw some hands here. When I asked the abstainers, I saw more, but I want to give the abstainers another choice. I don't have a right answer for this. It's a question. Does anybody want to raise their hand for A or B? Actually, Paul explained his reasons for that, and we have that clear. It, not being able to do it personally is not a reason to you know, choose, right? It's what you believe. Does anyone believe that the duty of ophthalmologists is less than preventing all preventable disease? Well, that's, this is important for you to know, and Avni is going to tell you what's undone, and then you'll have to come back and talk about strategies. Obviously, none of us expect any one of you to go out and do all of this. All right. The how is going to be very important for you and also which ophthalmologists have which obligation. Um, here are three quick scenarios, and this is my next to last slide. So Medicare has a medical, a patient, a Medicare patient has an indication for cataract surgery, and Medicare, I was liberal here, pays less than half of the usual charge for cash patients. So here's another ABC for you and uh, another choice. So A is proceed, do the procedure, and accept Medicare's payment. 
B is proceed and bill the patient for the balance. C is tell the patient you're a cash only, sorry. And D is actually check with administrators, and we have one here. So is that pretty clear? It's about somebody where insurance is gonna give you less than what you would get if you were taking care of another full pay patient, and those are your choices. Um, how many of you would proceed and accept the payment? That's A. And again, don't abstain, but vote for each one. So that's a, maybe a third, something like that. How many of you would proceed and bill the patient for balance? So it's great. So someone said it's illegal, and Brent is here, and he knows that. But I just want to show you what an interesting thing, that that might be your choice, but your choice is constrained by law. Remember, we talk about law, policy, et cetera. So here's a case where the law tells you you might want to do that, but if you do, there are consequences. C, tell the patient you are cash only. Can you do that? Are there some private practice docs here? First of all, you can. You can do that if you're not a Medicare enrolled provider. So, and Brent is helping. So again, some constraints. You can do that, but you would. it's interesting. If you're a cataract surgeon, you're giving up an awful lot of people that have the disorder you can treat and the payer that will pay you. But some communities would have plenty of older people with cataracts who could pay cash. So that's an option. Um, let's see. Check with administration. Do you need to? And if you're at Moran, I'm guessing that this is literally habitual, right? That you do this pretty much every day, and so you no longer need to check. And if you did check about balanced billing, administration would tell you you can't do that. <laughs> okay. Second one, this is an emergency. An ER doc asks you to see an uninsured patient with an eye injury. Do you refuse, see them, repair, and don't bill? See them, repair them, bill, and send that to collections, or check with administration? Uh, how many of you would refuse to see this patient? So once again, we're constrained by law. By the way, just so you know, the answer to that was not infrequent before EMTALA. So I mean, that was real. It was a choice that some physicians, I don't know data about ophthalmologists. I will tell you that surgeons declined to treat trauma patients before EMTALA was in place. So it really does happen, uh, did happen. B, uh, see them and repair them, but don't bill them. Does that sound good? Would any of you do that? Brent, what about that one? No. Why? Because our obligation is to bill. The collection is different. So by the way, for any of you that have practiced for a long time, seeing a patient and not billing was not unusual. That was something that doctors did. It's worth remembering. That is, some doctors thought it was their obligation to do charity care or care they knew wouldn't be reimbursed, and they didn't generate a bill. That's actually illegal if you accept Medicare funding. Fair enough. Uh, see, that was that one. Check with administration. So I think most of you would take care of that patient, and you would be obliged to bill. The last one is something that Avni is going to talk more about. Your local physician refers an uninsured, non-Medicare eligible 59-year-old Hispanic diabetic with cataracts AMD for indicated treatment. On this one, would some of you decline to see the patient? No. Would you proceed but not bill? We don't need to repeat that. You know you can't do that. Proceed and bill, that's actually probably what most of you would do. Tell me if I'm wrong on any of these. And then finally, check with administration. Do you have any questions about this one that an administrator could answer? Do you think you know what the law requires you to do? It's not an emergency. That's really important. <coughs> Brett, can you tell them what the legal choices might be here? Well, legally, um, the responsibility is to stabilize the patient. Let's look at the patient. Hispanic diabetic with cataracts and AMD. The definition of stable is not in jeopardy of life or limb <laughs> imminently. I don't think so. Stable? That was their obligation. Do they need to do anything else? Not for the law. Okay. Yeah? I just had one thing here. What if the patient was an illegal uh, immigrant? Let's talk about that. Did everyone hear? The question was, it's a wonderful question about policy. What if the patient was an illegal immigrant? So I showed you President Reagan signing EMTALA. Do any of you know what EMTALA says about whether someone is a citizen or not? Remember, it says a lot about emergently ill, 
a medical condition that is not stable, and the obligation is to get as far as stability. What about an illegal or undocumented individual? Ideas? Brett, do you know? Go ahead. I think it's silent to, the, to that point. Okay, so it's silent, but it says there's an obligation, and legal analysis has said regardless of citizenship. So just so you know, that's again unfunded and not likely to be funded because Brett and his team for your other unfunded patients will try to find help from Medicaid, other sources, et cetera. You're not gonna find that for an undocumented. The obligation, again, it's an obligation imposed on us, not by us, but it's there. So in this one, you could decline the 59-year-old Hispanic individual within the law. I'm gonna leave it for you to decide whether that's appropriate, inappropriate, whether you have a duty to that person. Let's leave the law aside for a while. Think about that. Dr. Jacobson. This is uh, right here. Yeah. Could I add one point? So we think about EMTALA usually about emergency departments, but we have a triage clinic here, and EMTALA is actually broader than just emergency departments. And it also, if you put yourself out as someone who receives emergency care, and we are very uh, close to that line with our triage center. And so from our institutional standpoint, we look at our own triage center as needing to comply with EMTALA just like we would the emergency room. And I think what, again, I hope you heard Brett, as you picture yourself more like an emergency room, publicly available, a uh, skilled provider for certain conditions, you're kind of holding up the sign that says, if you have this, we're here for you. The key issue is if you have this emergency, we're here for you. So that's really, really helpful. I kind of frame for you what Avni will fill in, and she's gonna start with this, which is kind of our first look at how are we doing if the goal or obligation was to take care of all preventable disease and prevent it, this is the reality. Avni, you wanna pick up? So thank you, uh, Dr. Jacobson, for that awesome introduction to this topic. Um, I'm Avni Shah, I'm the Global Fellow. For those of you that don't know me, like Dr. Petty said, it might be because I've been abroad uh, for most of the year, but it's been um, really fun coming home and looking introspectively at what we've been doing in Utah, especially for this talk. Um, so, you know, like Dr. Jacobson said, this is kind of moving now in the direction of now that we've established these are the current policies, we feel our obligation is this, how are we performing under the current policies and how are we performing relative to what we think our obligations are and who's getting missed specifically and how do we reach them? Um, and so I, I want you to kind of think about this, you know, in the framework of what is our obligation but does it matter are we thinking regionally? Are we thinking here just at Moran? Is our obligation extend to the state of Utah? Does it extend to the country? And you know we also work internationally, so sort of what, what framework um, for that obligation? And then does it matter if the patient um, that comes to us is a US citizen? Does it matter um, if that patient seeks care actively or not? So those are just some things to think about as we go through. Um, so these are just some statistics basically about the US and how we're doing in general. Um, 20, or sorry, 12 million people over the age of 40 have vision impairment. Um, 1 million are blind. 8 million have uncorrected refractive error. Um, and the amount of people experiencing blindness and visual impairment will double by 2030. The annual economic impact, and this is really important here, um, is more than $145 billion in the US. And so that includes both what the cost is and also um, what we're losing by those patients not being in the workforce by others taking care of them and not able to contribute. Um, and uh, half of 61 million high-risk adult Americans did not seek care in the last year and that major reasons are due to lack of awareness, um, costs, and lack of health insurance.
So um, this is from the IAPB Global Vision Atlas. This is actually a really helpful resource looking at prevalence of blindness and visual impairment um, across the world. And uh, this map is specifically looking at moderate or severe visual impairment, which is defined as 2060 to 2400. And um, you can see the US compared to the rest of the world is doing pretty well. We're in that lowest category of zero to 5%, but kind of just barely. It's at about 4.6% for this particular category. And um, the best country I could find was France at around 3.5%. And then for blindness, it's another 0.6% or so uh, prevalence in the US, with the best country being Iceland at about 0.3%. Um, within North America, these are the reasons for moderate or severe visual impairment. Um, you can see almost half or more than half of that is uncorrected, uncorrected refractive error, also cataract, um, AMD, diabetic retinopathy, and this is the proportion that's preventable or curable. So that's pretty striking when we think about you know, what we're doing in our own country. Um, and then a lot of people have seen these. This is sort of risk factors. Uh, definitely race is one of them, and uh, black Americans tend to have higher prevalence rates of blindness by most age groups until you get into the very elderly. Can you go back for a second? So male, female, just the scale is different on the two, and, and women have higher rates of, um, I mean, you may get to this, but blindness and uh, visual impairment consistently. Are you going to be addressing just question later? Was it a question? More than men? Just gender. Yeah. Gender, gender. Yeah. So I'm not really going to talk about why that is. We can talk about that as part of the discussion. But yeah, that has been consistent in my research as well. Um, and this I thought was pretty striking to me. So this is looking at the causes of blindness by race. And you can see here for, for white patients, you know, AMD is more than half, other, whatever that sort of nebulous category is. This is cataract, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, things that we say are definitely preventable or curable. It's this smaller wedge of the pie, whereas when you look at black patients, it's um, almost two-thirds or more, and Hispanic patients, it's more than half. So just kind of thinking about who's at risk and, you know, what we can do those patients uh, really have more proportion of preventable or curable disease uh, than white patients and are at higher risk. Um, this map shows the uh, moderate uh, or severe visual impairment not correctable with refractive um, error correction. And um, it's comparing uh, each individual state. So the proportion here in Utah is 1.8%. This is 1.8 per 100 patients that have moderate or severe visual impairment. And it's actually one of the best in the country, so it's in the top three. Um, and then uh, we're looking ahead at 2050, so this is 2015, and you see that all of the states get worse, and Utah goes to about 2.8%. And this is for blindness here, and again, Utah, 0.56%. That's, again, in the top three, and it's actually the best in the lower 48 states, so not too bad in comparison, and, of course, getting worse as well in 2050. Um, and here is uh, kind of this male and female breakdown here as well that Dr. Petty was talking about, that in almost all these categories, you see higher prevalence of these uh, you know, reasons for visual impairment and blindness in Utah, um, but that's also... a in the entire country as well, here by race. And kind of what I want to highlight here is the cost of vision problems just here in Utah is $1 billion. So when we think about our moral obligation and our professional obligation, there's also this economic component as well that we have to keep in mind. So looking at this, you know, and thinking about the fact that a lot of people raise their hand to say that we need to be preventing all visual impairment, that it's preventable, who's not being served in Utah and sort of what should our targets be? The system has historically been set up to most um, care for white, wealthy, and working patients. And I would add urban to this, especially in this state uh, where there are a lot of very, very rural patients. Um, and the patients that aren't really getting the care are patients that don't have good physical access to care based on locations of clinic, transportation issues, minority race, um, lower socioeconomic status, lack of insurance. These are all common things that most of us know. 
Um, and so this map shows the percentage of people 18 or older with severe vision loss by county, and this is self-reported um, based on a survey. Do you have a lot of difficulty um, seeing even with glasses on? So this is actually really helpful. And here's Utah here, and you can see the, the darker blue is the higher prevalence, and you can see where exactly um, we have the most problem here. And this is sort of a blown up version of this looking at adults over the age of 40. Um, you can see these southern counties here as well as here is sort of where we have the most um, unmet need and where we might want to focus if we think about um, moving ahead. Of course, this is San Juan County and the Navajo uh, Nation is right over here and, and we do work there. Um, and this is an interesting map. So it's taking the first map and it's superimposing uh, family income below the poverty level. And so this is areas where uh, these counties are both in the top quartile for severe vision loss and the bottom quartile for, for socioeconomic status for income. And San Juan County is one of those. And this is actually, um, this map was completed in 2013, which is the same time that we started working in Navajo. Unfortunately, there's not good data um, of this kind that's been published since then to really know if there's a change that we see in that county specifically. Um, so looking at race, uh, you know, more than 50% American Indian uh, in this county there. And then this is just showing uninsured patients um, in the rural counties specifically, and you can see uh, uh, between 10 and 20% uninsured in these rural counties. Um, this is a map showing uh, location of optometrists. Darker green is more optometrists. White means no data. Can we extrapolate that that means there are less or no optometrists? Maybe, I'm not sure, but helpful data to know. And then specifically for children, so um, overall we think between one and 5% of preschool age children have vision impairment, uh, but that's more than 5% when you look specifically at African American or Hispanic preschoolers. And this is the, the number of preschool aged children um, with visual impairment by race. And you can see over time this Hispanic white is going up. Pretty much every race is going up except non-Hispanic white. This is again preschool age children, pre prevalence of visual impairment. And this is per thousand, so it's not 11%, it's really 1%. Here's how Utah's doing relative to the rest of the country, and it is projected to go up. This is the state policy for vision screening in children. Um, basically, all it says is that when a child enters the Utah public school system, they need um, a document saying that they've had one eye exam uh, by a physician optometrist or other health professional and that they don't have any uh, visual problem. And there's no law about continuing vision screenings throughout school that's sort of left up to the schools. And then last thing here, um, being a member of a family who lives below the federal poverty level nearly doubles the likelihood that a child will be visually impaired compared with uh, children whose income is greater than 200%. So that sort of brings us to, you know, now we, we know the scope of the problem in Utah. We know who remains to be served, and we want to serve everyone. That's what we all raised our hands to say. So what are we doing here at the Moran for patients that that we see here, how are we a safety net hospital for patients that can't pay, and then we'll talk about what we're doing in terms of outreach. And so um, kind of touching on some of the questions that Dr. Jacobson had, and um, we're lucky to have Brent and Matt Bow here to help us sort of navigate what our policies are specifically, because this is our financial assistance policy, which is a little bit vague. Um, it does talk about only emergency or medically necessary care, so not elective cases like cataract surgery. It says we use a sliding scale for assistance based on income. Um, no patients over 300% of the federal poverty level are eligible for this program. Um, and these are the things you have to submit. And the hospital CFO or medical director has the authority to approve or deny. But it doesn't really lay out exactly who will be covered by this policy, who won't, and how we decide these things. Um, and I think this is important for us, specifically as physicians at the Moran, because when we have that patient sitting in our chair and we want to give them the right expectation for what we think we'd like to do for them and what their financial obligation is going to be, it's important for us to have a sense of, of what that'll be and, and who will be covered and how by these type of policies. Question. Brent, Brent, I know you need to leave. Before you 
step away, can you comment on that policy and the prioritization of Utah citizens versus out-of-state versus non-U.S. citizens? In the past, it used to be that you, we, we, you had to be domiciled in the state of Utah really to get access to the University of Utah's um, charity care uh, fund, if you will. That's not the case anymore. Now it's just based on uh, federal poverty level and a percentage of that. And there's actually more detail behind this, and Matt can speak to that after I leave. Um, but uh, I think an interesting point to, as you look at you know, how you prioritize all of this is um, last year the University Hospital spent $118 million in, in, in charity care activities. And you think, I don't know what their top dollar is, I think it's like $1.2 billion or so, but if you, you do the math there, you're looking at almost 10% of that, that top dollar went into some charity care kind of, a, of activity. Um, and so that's what the university hospital is doing in the community outside of what we do in outreach. And um, here at Moran, uh, we had over a million dollars of costs that went to charity care, not counting what goes into our specific outreach division. And so, you know, not quite, you know, a 10%, you know, it's less than 5% for us. But in terms of scale, you know, that's what we are doing uh, for using our resources for, for charity care. Can I just ask a cross question to Brent? If Utah had passed the expansion to Medicaid, what effect do you think that would have had on the budget you just described? It would have re definitely it would have reduced the charity care contribution um, for for yeah, all of the advice on what part of it might go away or what proportion? And, yeah, I don't have okay. that thought. Yeah. Interestingly, though, is that when uh, when when um, the Obamacare Act was implemented that we actually had more access to patients. So we did, at that point, we had a drop in our charity care contributions. So that's great. going both, thank, both thank directions. You. Thank you. Um, and if you could maybe sort of clarify for us in these particular situations, which are all different, and these are patients that are here, showed up to our clinic, you know, are in an attendings clinic, um, you know, one patient has neovascular glaucoma, needs an emergency tube. A patient who just came in with a symptomatic complaint is getting an exam, getting a facility fee in a clinic, might need a diagnostic procedure. Or a patient who's fine but um, would benefit from an elective surgery that could prevent or cure a blinding condition. What is the process? What are the options for these patients um, within the system that we have now here at the Moran at the U? and kind of touch on what percent of patients that you know, apply for this policy actually benefit and, and who are those patients that benefit, who decides medical necessity, what's included, any of those things, if you could um, clarify for us, it'd be great. Matt's the best person to do that, if you want to jump in. Yeah. I just got more of a global view. Unfortunately, I don't have specific to my hand, but just this morning, the numbers came from May 2018 to May 2019, the university, um, the patients that applied for this financial assistance policy was just over 5,000. The people that had, were approved for this assistance, either full charity or partial, was just over 4,000. So about 80% of those who apply, who go through this process, are approved. And I was actually relieved to see that number so high, but then my mind went immediately to, well, what about the other 20%? What happened? And I don't have the data uh, immediately available right now to why, you know, what happened to the other 20%? Was it incomplete, you know, applications or, um, you know, why were they denied? Um, but I, like I said, I was, I was pleasantly surprised to see, you know, that 80%. Um, and, and the key take home message I think for me is we should be putting them through this process as soon as possible. Um, we have in-house patient financial advocates. Uh, we're fortunate to have that at the Moran. Not all organizations, um, departments have that in-house. Um, and so when you come across these patients who could benefit from this financial assistance policy, the best thing to do is, is set up an appointment with that patient financial advocate so they can help the patient get started on this process. The sooner the better.
because once they're approved, they're approved for a six month time period. Um, it is a little backwards in the sense that it's retroactive, so they have to have a claim out in order to be approved, um, but it, it, it can be retroactive um, going back to that first if, if the application is complete. So Matt, just to be clear, they can't get the answer of how much will be covered before it's done. Correct. They have to have it done. Correct. And then, and then, and then just one other question. <laughs> Elective cataract surgery through this mechanism is never, rarely, ever approved? I don't have a direct answer to that. It's my understanding that, that because it's an elective, kind of purely elective procedure, regardless of vision, that this is not a mechanism that they have ever forgiven for cataract surgery after the fact, or a portion of it. Matt, do you know how much of that figure that Brent quoted is attributable to patients that have gone through this process as opposed to people who just obtained care and then decided not to pay for it? I don't. I know that specific to Moran, I don't know, I don't have the number of people who apply for financial assistance through this program specific to Moran, but I do have a number who are approved and that's 270 patients okay. in that year. But I don't, I don't have that broken down by that million dollars. <coughs> Okay, so thank you so much for that. That's very helpful. Um, so now sort of moving outside of, you know, the immediate Moran premise and moving to what are we doing as an institution um, in our local community. We do have these community clinics many of you know about. We have a, a homeless clinic, refugee clinic a couple times a year, the 4th Street uh, Malihe and, and People's Health Clinics where we go monthly. Um, these are the, uh, the number of patient visits in 2018. Um, and just for reference, based estimates based on other sources, these are the amount of uninsured in these counties and the amount uh, that would have severe visual impairment. So we can kind of look at those numbers and who we're getting out to see. And the Navajo Nation, um, we, we work down here. So there's a very, very small part of the Navajo Nation here in Utah, and actually only 7,000 of the 170,000 Navajo patients are here in Utah, but we do see patients from the entire Navajo Nation. In 2018, um, these are the numbers in terms of patient visits, surgeries, procedures, glasses. Um, I will mention there is an optometrist who serves that area, Dr. Kirk, who we've been working closely with, so even when we're not there, there is follow-up care happening. And there will be um, optical shop opening down there and training for the optical staff um, upcoming. Um, operation site, we do this twice a day, charity surgery day, most of us know about this. These are specifically for patients that are referred from these community clinics um, and are not otherwise eligible for insurance or discounts. So the first thing we do when these patients come is make sure that they can't benefit from Medicaid or, or the financial assistance policy. And if they can't, they get put on a list. Um, sometimes they do wait up to nine months for surgery, just because these, this is twice a year that this happens. Uh, last calendar year, we had 51 patients, and that's at Moran, as well as at some of our partners in the community that did some of these surgeries as well. They were all FACO surgeries, one make surgery. And from what I understand, that's sort of the policy for these surgeries is that um, they have to be a topical case. So how is this set up? Um, normally happens on a Saturday. The staff donate their time. Industry, their Alcon or AMO, will donate the consumables for the surgery. Either there's no facility fee generated or it's generated and written off, and maybe you can clarify that for me. Um, outreach actually will buy uh, medications in bulk, and um, ASCRS Foundation will pay um, a small sum per patient back to outreach. And just to get a sense for an entire charity surgery day where we did 30 patients, the cost of all of the medications that outreach bought directly from the pharmacy and then gave back to the patients was $217, so not, not really very much, so it, it works well. Um, can you comment on the facility fee? Okay. Okay. Um, and so I, I wanted to take just a, a little bit of a look at other programs around the country, and obviously this is just 
brief, um, and I talk to other people that have come from other institutions about their experiences. So here are two examples. This is Henry Ford, um, who's the University of Miami. These are their financial assistance policies. They're a little more direct than ours is in terms of exactly who's going to be covered and who's not. Um, they both do also mention medical necessity and emergency, and so it's a little bit less clear what they'll do for an elective case like a cataract surgery. Um, and so you can see this is income less than 250% of the federal poverty level for 100% um, discount. And then if it's above that, they may qualify for a 30, uh, for medical debt being reduced to 30% of household income, which is still quite a bit. Um, this is the University of Miami. They'll give full assistance um, to patients that qualify up to 400% of the federal uh, poverty level, and this all just depends on sort of local um, funds and politics and policies. At the U, where I did my residency, um, it's actually quite bad. So this is what they have on the website, very, very vague. If you think you can't pay, talk to a financial counselor. There's no other information about who would be covered by a financial assistance policy. And from working there, uh, there basically is no safety net for patients in Aurora County at the University Hospital, and it's a problem. Um, this is uh, Dartmouth, something they've done to try and um, access their rural populations that they found weren't coming in for care. Um, they basically sent medical students out to community clinics and some rural communities. They trained them how to do a basic screening, and then they referred the patients um, back to uh, Dartmouth, essentially, to be seen. And they did pretty well. So 72% of the patients they saw were referred. Most of them attended their appointments. 88% had abnormal findings, although some of these include things like glaucoma suspect, amblyopia. Um, basically, they were given free care for their first visit. They were given a $50 voucher for glasses. Uh, the question then being for, you know, these glaucoma suspects and other patients, you know, what's done for them long term after this one visit, hard to tell. Um, but they said, you know, the patients hadn't sought eye care for about seven years before that, so it's at least getting people plugged in. And that's how they sort of dealt with their the problem of, of rural patients not being able to access care. So, you know, in, in doing this research and looking around and talking to people, what I've concluded is that we're actually doing quite well here at the University of Utah um, in terms of what we're able to achieve for our patients here, what we're able to do in our communities. Um, and, that's, and that's hugely important, and that's due in no small part to everyone's efforts um, along the way over the last several years to get to where we are now. Um, and as you know, an institution where one of our core missions is outreach, and we all raised our hand saying we want to prevent all preventable blindness, and as leaders in this field, you know, we should really ask, can we raise the bar even higher? Could we do better? Should we do better? What does that look like? And what are our barriers to achieving that vision? And that's sort of where we're going to go from here. These are some of the things that I could think of, and we'll open up the discussion and talk about other barriers or how to kind of get past these. Um, obviously, there's geographical issues here, cultural issues. Um, you know, there's some sort of a funding cap for indigent care even here at the university. We can't pay for everyone to do everything. Um, human resources, you know, there are some places where residents will do a satellite um, rural rotation where they'll go out into a rural area for a few months and they'll see patients there or a couple once or twice a week, something like that, and they'll sort of refer patients back to the main uh, site. You know, a medical student screening clinic, kind of like what Dartmouth did, and then institutional and regul regulatory barriers, which can be a big one. You know, do we need to negotiate on a different level with administration, other departments here at the hospital? Um, and then where exactly should we focus and what should we target? We need to be very targeted in our approach if we're going to try and expand. This is something that was done in Chicago. They basically created a, a hot spot map for undiagnosed diabetic retinopathy. So, you know, they used patients that came into the clinic based on where they came from, their physical address and their demographic to then plot, you know, where are areas that, that have the most need in terms of diabetic retinopathy. And so they now know exactly where to go 
Um, and so that could be something that we could look into doing in Utah. Um, Medicaid expansion did pass, and so I just want to briefly touch on what that means. This is uh, where we are right now. This is the bridge. Um, this will eventually expire, and one of these plans will take effect. Uh, this bridge means that uh, we go up to the 100% federal poverty level and who's covered by Medicaid, but it is otherwise a bit restrictive. And what Utah wants to pass permanently is this per capita cap. It has to be approved by the federal government um, first, and this is also restrictive. It's still only 100% of the federal poverty level. There's these self-sufficiency work, work requirements. There's caps, and so... Um, it's not as expanded as some of the most expanded programs. However, if this um, waiver is not granted by the federal government, and if this next slightly less restrictive plan is also not granted, we will automatically go into full expansion, and that's up to 138% of the federal poverty level and less restricted. So that sort of will keep an eye out on what's to come. Um, with this here, we'll, we'll treat um, an additional 70 to 90,000 patients and in Utah, and if we go to full expansion, that's an additional 40,000 patients. So where do we go from here? This is my last slide, and then I really wanna open it up to discussion, and, and Dr. Jacobson, if you wouldn't mind moderating, that'd be excellent, but this is just kind of, you know, some thoughts going forward and kind of everything we could think of here. You know, do we focus on areas with a high prevalence of blindness or high risk here in Utah? And, and who's there and what are we seeing? Do we know exactly, you know, are there, do we know where all the optometrists and ophthalmologists are? Can we ask them what do they see in their clinics? And if, if we don't know, should we do some type of screening survey? Is it mostly a refractive error, cataract, things that are easy to treat? If there's a lot of diabetic retinopathy, should we start setting up some telemedicine? Um, this idea of more operation site days or maybe integrating it into work days is something that's being discussed right now. Um, you know, outreach right now is donor funded and, you know, do we need more funds directed towards things like this? Would that ultimately um, be a change in policy and that's sort of what we're getting back to? Um, and then this is kind of important too, you know, I think we have to take a step back and look at this from a public health perspective of is it worth it? And, and this idea of justice, if we're going really, really deeply into the rural community to find a couple patients and bust them all the way back to the Moran and treat them. We'll feel good about what we did, but are we using our resources wisely? And I think the only way to know that is to really do um, some sort of a pilot study on the economic impact of doing something like that. Um, and so, Dr. Jacobson, if you wouldn't mind. That's great. Uh, first of all, thank you, Avni. And I, my hope is that some of that was valuable for you. I certainly didn't know this level of detail about visual impairment in Utah. And I think that everything that Avni shared was really helpful to me, as I said right in the beginning. If you have a better idea of the causes of a problem or a situation, you have a much better opportunity to think about solutions. The other thing that I want to add about the comments that Brett and Matt helped us out with is maybe the best <clears throat> examples there are the micro and macro vision. For the most part, charity within a hospital setting focuses on the patients who present. And as Brett mentioned, it's actually the ones who actually get treated. So an interesting example there is you treat the ones you must, for sure. So the emergencies that show up do get treated, and then the charity care is a way of addressing that unaddressed issue in the Reagan rule, the EMTALA law. So we got that. The macro side is what proportion of any problem are you actually seeing that comes to the hospital? And I'll just tell you that for infectious disease, for example, we often use multipliers of 1 to 10 or 1 to 100. So in other words, a good example currently you could think about a case of measles that comes to the hospital is actually extraordinary. It's around one in a thousand cases of measles that develop meningitis or encephalitis. That child will go to the hospital. But if I see a child with encephalitis due to measles, that pretty much tells me there are a thousand children that I haven't seen. And I think that's again where Avni slides are really helpful to you. That is, even when you talk about the proportion of charity care that's given, you want to keep those caveats in mind. A lot of that is addressing what you had a legal obligation to provide, and the emergency was often the catalyst that brought, let's just use the accident victim, that's going to happen. Somebody injured at work, seriously, automobile accident, they will be brought to you. That's often not a volitional thing. The bigger problem is actually volitional. 
And what you want to remember is for elective disease, people that are uninsured are actually unlikely to present. They're unlikely to present for screening exams, and a positive screening exam may leave them unlikely to present for treatment. I'll just share that with you. Where I live as an internist, a woman may not go for a screening mammogram because she's not insured. If she finds the money to go for a mammogram and they find a tumor, she may not go for surgery or for further treatment because it's going to be unfunded. And it may not be provided. Again, just back to this EMTALA rule, if it's not an emergency, people may not be under the obligation to do it, and she will stay away. So one of the things that Jeff asked, um, Avni's research and some of mine getting ready, helps to answer. To the best of my knowledge, I don't think we see the gender difference in children in terms of refractive errors, et cetera. But you asked about women. It's adult women. And so things to think about that are very peculiar in our country, it's worth thinking about how they are in Iceland or countries with universal health care. Women have historically been less likely to be employed. That actually means in our country less likely to be insured. Fair? The next one is studies of, of Hispanic women in particular. And on her slide, the blue arrow pointing straight up with incidents increasing with age was in Hispanics. It's more in Hispanic women than men. A couple of reasons from epidemiologic studies. One is they're not so aware that conditions diagnosed early can be prevented. Secondly, they have a prevalent cultural belief, it's not all, but more prevalent in that community, that what happens is kind of faded, that seeing doctors and doing things doesn't really change very much. This was meant to be. So that's a deterrent. The next one is, of course, money and uninsured. And many of them are in situations now where they're undocumented, but their children are documented, and they're extremely hesitant to even apply for insurance or show up at an emergency room or a clinic. Yet another deterrent. The last one is, within their culture, they're very preoccupied with caring for others and less preoccupied with caring for themselves. So those are some hurdles that, you know, they're all outside. They're things that keep people from seeing you. And I think Avni's example is a really interesting one of geographic targeting and then using low-cost individuals like mid-levels or medical students to do the screening that wouldn't otherwise happen. But if you want it to follow through, you need a program to provide the care. So that's just introductory, micro, macro. What do you all think, now that you've kind of seen both what you're doing and what's undone about anything that you would want to see in policy, either at your own hospital, the state, or the federal level, that could make you feel better? That is, I was looking at numbers like in the tens or hundreds of thousands and interventions that are addressing hundreds or thousands. So there's a big need out there. What are your thoughts? Have you seen a program or a policy that you actually like, or even you have a reason to dislike? Yeah? On a policy level, I mean, I think a, 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 a program that comes to mind is the Miami-Dade County Public Health Trust. So it's a, a, a tax increase, a sales tax increase, pretty minimal, that the county voted on to approve, and it goes into a public health trust, and it funds uninsured or lower income Patients. And the lower income is actually fairly generous. A lot of the residents and fellows actually qualified for it, especially <laughs> if they had one, two, or more children. Yep. So it was actually much more uh, encompassing than either Medicaid or Medicare for, for patients in, in uh, younger age ranges. And it provided care at any of the um, county hospitals or facilities, which included if they didn't have a specialty, they would partner. So that's how the University of Miami would become a partner of that. Uh, county public health trust and it basically you could get I mean even though when the hepatitis C treatment came out that was about $90,000 there was controversy in the county because the patients could receive that as a part of it whereas there was fully insured patients you know who were unable to because insurances weren't willing to cover that $90,000 treatment so it was a, it was a pretty successful um, program and it was at a government or policy level was it um, but a democratic decision as well and it's a county program, is that right? Yeah, so yeah. That, that was the one very or one of the barriers you run into. Was one, you had to have some form of proof of residency, so an, a totally illegal person without any paperwork was uh, excluded, but you didn't have to be a citizen. 
Um, and then anybody who lived outside the county um, wasn't, uh, wasn't included as well. So those were the, the main barriers we faced as, as providers. Two minutes, one minute. One, one minute. So thank, do you know if that plan covered vision health? Um, I don't know if it included like refractive health, but yeah. if you came through the ophthalmologist, then yes. So right. you, we, we provided full eye care, vision care as a part of it, and you would get a refraction as part of it. So you'd get a normal eye exam, you get a, a, but it, I don't think it covered the glasses, for example. So I'm understanding. Eye. So those are actually very, very important points that you're making. You also make a great point that even a geographic um, political bounded area like a county can take an initiative, and then thinking back to Avni's slides, that's actually a really interesting idea whether you go to a county. It's not going to look good here at the county level because the disease is going to be in your poorest counties. So it's going to be hard for the county to raise the funds to take care of the problem. But it wouldn't be a problem for state government to allocate but only to one county. The other thing I think you learned through this is you get a lot of bang for your buck. It's actually kind of interesting um, with some of the impairment, which is as easy to correct as refraction, the cost of improving vision could be very low. And I think we need more studies to back up OVNIs, which actually show the other side. What are the benefits that are gained from preventing blindness and improving vision? And my guess is that you would be able to make a really strong case. So that's a really lovely idea. The other one, I think we're gonna be out of time, is to think about either volunteerism or that language from your own code, which was cost-effective care. There are so many things that you could be thinking, doing. think about the geographic. So some sort of telemedicine outreach or volunteers, students, or, or mid-levels going to an area and then referring up would really be a good idea. And wouldn't it be exciting to have Avni back in about five years and look at the data that she showed you now and just to feel like you're actually moving closer. Again, we're all limited by possibility, but there's no reason we couldn't move closer to doing a better job for the unmet need. Last comment. Sorry, quickly, regarding this, I was curious. So with all the, the data was, that was expressed about the charity care from the University of the Moran, I assume that's all written off. Do physicians here truly have the ability to waive our physicians' fees preemptively? And if so, um, how does that work? And is there any ability for physicians to write off fees? The, the university is obviously benefiting from that as, a, as you know, financially. What happens for a physician if he chooses to do that, if he's able? Case by case. Case. by administration. So, so if we say we will waive our fee, it's not guaranteed. Correct. We can't tell the patient that, Correct. honestly. That's been taken out of our hands directly in the building to do that. You may think you're waiving your fee when on the back end a fee is actually added. And so that's why it actually needs to go up to administration to make sure that the patient doesn't receive this, this bill. So you may be telling them, hey, well, I'm not going to charge. Or on the back end, it is through the documentation that bill is being So it, it's actually a lovely thing to end on. First of all, let me thank you for your comment and your question. As you're looking at policy or talking to a candidate, something that you might want to consider is bringing up the issues that you think need to be corrected. So for example, that very question about could a physician's donation of services count as a charitable act, that's allowable for many, many other professions. So it's something to talk about. And you also want to think about the cost shift in that. If it is allowable and you get a benefit back, it means the government is taking on some cost for the care provided. But I'll tell you, the cost of a tax deduction might actually be a lot less for government than the cost of the full procedure. So that's a clever idea. Please look for whether vision is covered in any policy that you look at and consider in a plan that's going to be a menu plan. By the way, Oregon had that for their underinsured. It's like these services are covered and these are not. I think you could make tremendous arguments that taking better care of vision is a cost-effective choice. Thank you so very much for your time and attention. <laughs>